the Glass System Thinking Ontario, where uh, Judith was present and we talked about anticipatory systems. I wasn't able to remember the details back then, but all I remembered was my favorite uh, metaphor of the leaves, um, of the tree uh, anticipate, anticipating um, and the leaves chain color. And recently, so for this session, now I'm transitioning. Um, recently, we've been experimenting with going back in person and online when and where available. So we had a conversation. It was September, I believe. August. Uh, I, I thought August. Was okay. Wow. Time flies. Yeah. August. Judith. Um, and she was in town and we had a wonderful little informal kind of chat at OCAD University for that Systems okay. Thinking Ontario session. And uh, this session is for, you know, Judith is going to prepare, has prepared a few slides to chat through um, a lot of these concepts. And so, um, you, know, you know, very briefly, you know, just to read the bio, Judith Rosen is a writer and a science researcher residing in Rochester. Uh, and she carries on the work of her father, Robert Rosen, who some of us may have been familiar with his work, republishing materials previously unavailable. Judith, mm -hmm. Judith often translates the ideas of Robert Rosen to both experts and novices, depending on the audience. And she has been a longtime contributor to the International Society for the System Science, IEEE-S, and have served as vice president of conferences. So thank mm -hmm. you, Judith, for being here. Today, we're going to chat about um, anticipatory systems. And if you give me just a moment, I'll switch screens. I'll share sure. your slides. Judith, yeah. you can just you can just ping me with saying uh, next slide, and I'll, I'll move on to the next one okay. uh, based on your... Yeah. So there, there was a paper that... Um that I used for the August talk and, uh, but David Ng wanted it to be more of a, uh, just a discussion circle. And so he didn't want slides and he didn't want, um, you know, a formal paper. So he said there was gonna be this recording um, capability that would then live on YouTube forever. <laughs> and so he said, do the paper then and you can put together a, you know, a slide presentation of the ideas so that was the main thing and everybody that's here should be able to I don't know how we'll do this but um, you should get a copy of the paper because um, it's got you know when I do a, a paper and a talk and slides I don't want it to all be exactly the same thing so there's information in the slides that isn't in the paper that isn't in the you know the talk i'm not just going to read the slides or whatever um i figure you guys can have the slides and i'll just describe things that aren't in them you know so much or just go through them pretty quickly but um there's so much you know this st stuff all connects together for example before we even start i'll tell you um this sort of assumes that you you know what systems thinking, you know, system science is and how it differs from say traditional reductionist science. And the way my father used to describe systems thinking and system science was that we needed another mode of approach than reductionism to deal with complex systems. Because if you take a complex system apart to study the parts, you will not learn about the complex system at all. You'll learn about the parts. And, you know, his feeling was that if you want to learn about atoms, study atoms. But if you want to learn about organisms, studying atoms won't help you. And so, you know, his feeling was that reductionism is useful for some aspects of biology, but uh, we need other capacities in science that are equally rigorous um, for approaching these kinds of systems without damaging them, you know, and studying the rubble, basically. And so uh, with organisms, he said, once you kill an organism to dissect it and run it through a, you know, gas chromatographer or whatever else, uh, you've already lost too much information to understand why it was alive in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so because he was trying to answer the question, why are living organisms alive? What causes life? Uh, he felt, you know, after going at it through like traditional science and physics and not getting anywhere, he realized that there has to be something missing in the tools mm -hmm. that we've built. And since physics was basically developed to 
understand orbital mechanics and things like that, it was never, it never had to approach life. It never had to approach complexity. It never had to deal with those things. And so all these anomalies start to show based on what is missing in the tools. And, you know, part of his uh, career was spent uh, sort of near the beginning. It was spent going through the history of how science developed the way it is and why the prohibitions exist. And, you know, uh, you must not allow the future to impact the present and things like that. Um, <laughs> and a lot of it, he felt, was based on assumptions that actually are not appropriate yes, yes. and were never questioned again. You know, once someone gets far enough along in their education in science, they don't want to go back to those fundamental uh, beginnings and things. So anyway, the systems... Um, movement doesn't always agree with my father about what systems thinking is or what system sciences should be. And so, you know, there's a range, there's a range of what, of, of people and their opinions um, and their ideas. And so it, it often gets, you know, kind of uh, contentious. Um, I have talked with several of the, um, past presidents of, of the IFSS, and uh, some of them were really open to the way my father looked at it, and a few were absolutely totally not, you know? <laughs> they preferred kind of a more reductionist approach to systems, mm -hmm. which, you know, for me is a ludicrous kind of concept, that you're gonna get reductionist about trying to not be reductionist. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is where, you know, you get into the typical human kind of uh, range of ideas and beliefs and egos and all of that stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you will find all kinds in the systems uh, movement, but for me, it, you know, it's, it's the place to be. It's the place mm -hmm. to, to, uh, really try to figure out how to better help our planet without harming it more. And if, mm -hmm. you know, if you agree that that complexity is something that you can't take apart to study, then if you treat it like you can take it apart, um, you're going to do damage and cause side effects and may not even achieve the original goal that you wanted to achieve because the side effects will be so much worse mm -hmm. or whatever. So this is, this is very much a, a conversation that's worth having. And in fact, um, I, I touch on that a little bit through this slide mm -hmm. uh, presentation, but it's not the main, you know, subject, but hopefully what is, you know, talked about will be useful. So we'll, we'll get going. So, Okay, you can go to the next one. Um, next slide. Yeah, so there's my dad. Mm -hmm. uh, he was, um, he, he sort of stumbled onto this idea that living organisms don't just react like the rest of the universe does, that they also do things ahead of events. I mean, it's clear that they're responding to an upcoming event if it's something that always happens in a cyclical way in their in native environment, they have somehow encoded that into themselves and they get ready for winter in autumn, you know, like the trees that Zad was talking about. So um, he started to notice that this was a pattern in all life. And he, he sort of realized uh, that the, you know, human beings trying to, at the Hutchins Institute, they used to talk about planning and what should we be doing now so things will get better and so forth with, with human society. And uh, he realized that all life is constantly trying to optimize according to stuff. You know, you can't really understand its behavior in the present unless you include the fact that it's got a future prediction that it's navigating by and the only way he could see that they could be bringing the future into the present is through prediction and modeling so he developed a, a diagram to 
to show what modeling is and click to the next slide. I think that might be the next one. Yep. Right. So this is, this is his modeling relation diagram and it's a little bit, I didn't want to write all the stuff that uh, I'm going to say right now because that's a lot of typing and you don't want to read it. But <laughs> what, what he had here was the nat the N box is the natural system. And uh -huh. arrow number one, which says causal, is all of the entailment that makes that natural system do what it does and able to do what it does. And arrow number two, which is encoding, is our activity trying to observe the natural system and somehow create inferential entailment in and F is the model or the formal system that we're creating to represent N. And arrow number three is the inferential entailment that is supposed to represent the causal entailment. So if we do it well, if we do it with enough accuracy and thoroughness for the aspect of the natural system that we want to predict, then arrow number four is decoding, where you compare the predictions from the model to the behavior of the natural system. And only if we've done it right and that arrow matches, will this model then be reliable and able to accurately predict those aspects of the natural system. And he, he said, you know, if we're doing this in science, that means that this entailment exists in nature. That stands to reason, right? But he started to recognize that if, if living organisms, even single-celled living organisms, are behaving in ways that are pulling the future into the present, they're behaving in ways that uh, they, they know what their food is before they even encounter it. They, they know what their host is if they're a virus, say, or they know... Uh, you know, what to be afraid of in their environment. Th that kind of information seemed to him to be acting like a set of models, encoded models, predicting for them. Because you can find error behavior all over the place in nature. You can see mistakes that organisms make in recognition. You can see, um, and I'm going to get into that with lots and lots and lots of pictures and, and examples, but... Um, error is is kind of the bane of the activity of modeling it's kind of almost ever present it's an continual you know danger kind of thing in modeling and uh he felt that there was enough you know um evidence that these mm. these rules of nature that he he was trying to describe that we use in science are already, the reason we use them in science is because they're already in action in our bodies and our minds. I mean, it's just the way that life works. Um, <laughs> so, so what is an anticipatory system? It is a living organism. That is the, the best way my father could describe what a living organism is and, and his his description was that every living organism we have ever encountered, and he felt it was going to be also true that any extraterrestrial life will also be the same in that way. This is the thing that all life has in common. It's got an organization that involves the capacity to be anticipatory, to use uh, encoded information that is, you know, built into models and use the models then to predict uh, next behavior from current behavior of environment or um, of various other aspects uh, of what it experiences throughout its life. And it's a kind of a constant that links all life. And it seems to be heritable also because, for example, all the birds of a particular species build their nests the same way. And they're so similar that you can identify species from the nest. 
So whatever it is that has these, you know, a species of bird building all the same kind of nest isn't a learned behavior. It's a, it's something that they've inherited. So it's some kind of encoded information based uh, navigation they're using. And it doesn't require a thought pattern, you know, or a thought process. It doesn't require a central nervous system. It doesn't require a brain um, because plants do it, um, bacteria do it, I, even viruses do that. And so this is kind of a, um, an interesting aspect of life that rarely gets looked at or discussed, but if it is the fundamental, like the signature of life is what I call it, um, this anticipatory behavior pattern, then we should know that, shouldn't we? I mean, we are alive. It seems to me that, that it kind of behooves us to understand this about ourselves. And if we wanna help the biosphere um, recover from whatever damage we're inflicted currently, uh, you know, we want to make sure that we do it in a way that doesn't accidentally make it worse because we didn't understand what it is that is doing the, work, the most damage. So anyway, <clears throat> what he was most um, blown away by, really, was, was that we see this all the time where organisms are changing their behavior in the present according to something that hasn't happened yet. And it's not prophecy, it's prediction. And the reason he concluded that and the way that he could tell is because of the error behaviors that they manifest um, where predictions are wrong. And some of these are used by other species, you know, to do what they need to do. So they'll try to throw, say a predator will try to put their prey species into an error state by making it like using some sort of camouflage so that their prey don't see them the prey think that they're just looking at you know twigs and trees and leaves and whatever and then it it turns out uh-oh that's a snake and it, you know whatever i mean i just as i was finding pictures for this and i have a picture of it there's a snake that has the tail, the tip of its tail looks like a spider and it waves it around just like a spider moves and birds come down and try to catch it. And then the snake strikes and eats the birds. I mean, it's just amazing that that kind of an error, um, you know, making the bird mistake that the snake's tail for something it could eat and then it gets eaten because of that the snake is then using its own models against it, you know, against its prey. And that's something that you see happening all the, all the time. It's kind of like an arms race in environments where predators and prey are constantly doing that to each other. And so you're also seeing then that it's not just these organisms interacting themselves in an environment, but their models are interacting also. And when you start to recognize just how much the models are involved in these interactions and in these, you know, the way that that snake gets its meal is by causing an error in the models of its prey, you start to realize this has to be active in evolutionary entailment also. How could it not be, right? If you accept that, um, living organisms are using models to predict behavior of their environment, behavior of aspects of the environment, including prey or predators or what have you, then you have to recognize that these interactions that involve their models are also part of evolutionary entailment. And so you can't really understand evolution then unless you take this anticipatory aspect of life into account and build it into the scientific models that we have. So it's all kind of, kind of feeds back on itself. Okay, go to the next, um, the next one. I, one of my favorite species to talk about 
you know, just the intricacy of these heritable models that, that don't even require intelligence, they don't require being taught how to do anything, is the migration patterns of the Eastern monarch butterfly. And I don't know, is there anybody here who has never heard of them, of monarchs? Maybe in Australia? No? Well, they, they overwinter in mountains in Mexico because they can't handle freezing temperatures. But they start flying north in spring. And the ones that fly north lay eggs. The eggs hatch. They grow. They pupate. Adults come out. They mate. They lay, you know, they fly further north. They lay eggs. And so the ones that are in Canada by late August are like the fourth generation from Mexico. So it's not like the ones from Mexico got all the way up to Canada. That's not how it works. They've already died after laying eggs. And it's their like great, 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 you know, grandchildren that are up in Canada. And something triggers that generation to turn around and start flying south. And that generation lives through the winter. They don't die in like two months the way their predecessors did. They get all the way to Mexico. They, they find their way to the exact same mountainous areas. There's a few sort of specialized areas with the right kinds of trees and the right conditions for them. And they spend the winter there. And then in the spring, they start flying north and, and mate and lay eggs and it starts all over again. And they use a, a plant called a milkweed plant to lay their eggs on because it has latex sap. It's got a um, toxic kind of sap and the butterfly's bodies are able to sequester the toxin. It doesn't poison them, but it makes them poisonous. And so any bird that tries to eat one will never do it again. You know, they, they sort of throw it up and, and feel awful. Um, so that their coloration pattern has then led to other butterflies mimicking their wing color and design because it protects them from predation. And so, you know, there's all of this information and coding and uh, use for navigation that just is mind blowing. The more you think about it, the more you realize the intricacy that can be involved. To try to think about how to navigate to Mexico from Canada as a butterfly without, you know, much of a brain. And certainly the only uh, gift it got from its mother was to have its egg laid on the right plant, you know, is just astonishing. It's astonishing. And yet for four generations after the last group of butterflies left Mexico, they turn around and fly down to the exact same place. So it has to be a heritable set of models encoded that they're using for navigation and their behavior. And it's just, it's just a beautiful example of how this does not have to require any thought process at all. And in fact, human mind, I think, is an evolutionary um, concentration of the ability to model you know, to, to gather information, to encode information into memory, to learn, which is memory and encoding, and, um, and then to use what we have encoded to predict what we should do in any new situation that seems to require problem solving or whatever. So that is the, one of my favorite examples. And, and it's kind of a, um, you can't argue with, with, the idea that they are using encoded information that they inherited, you know, it's just, it's, a, it's, it is what it is. Okay. Go to the next, the next slide. This one is fun because it involves trees doing something, you know, trees predicting. Um, and it's not about winter the way it is with um, going dormant before winter by, you know, dropping the leaves in autumn and so forth. Um, within 
you know, minutes of a giraffe starting to, to chew on the leaves of an acacia tree, the tree starts to increase the level of tannins in its leaves and it starts to emit ethylene gas, which is a warning, a warning sign to other acacia trees nearby that there are grazing animals chewing on it. And they start to increase the tannin in their leaves. So tannins are apparently so toxic to giraffes that if they just kept eating them, they would die. It would end up causing terrible trouble with their uh, metabolic system. So, and it, I guess it tastes terrible also. So they usually will stop chewing on each tree within about 15 or 20 minutes and move on to the next one. And they have learned to approach these trees from downwind instead of going upwind because then the trees, all the trees in the row will have the same level of high tannins in their leaves and they won't be able to eat any more in that group. So they start downwind and work their way upwind so that the tree, the ethylene gas can't, uh, you know, sour the, the food source for them. And it's just, it's an amazing, to me, that's an amazing that it can happen that fast, 30 minutes of within a 30 minutes of a giraffe starting to chew on the leaves. The tree has increased the, the level of tannins to a level that the giraffes better stop or else it's going to, you know, they're going to share the pain. <laughs> so, and they can't think, you know, this is, a, this is a, a real time event and it's measurable. It's been um, reproduced. They've been able to show that it does indeed happen and measure just how much ethylene gas, just how much tannins. It's, it's amazing, amazing to me that the trees are able to do that. Okay, next, next slide. So we've all sort of seen the, the situation where there are cleaner fish, right? That that big predators like sharks and uh, and other fish eating fish and and turtles and stuff uh, will go and and just hover and wait and be you know motionless while these cleaner fish will go around and look for parasites and pick them off and eat them um, and they even go in the mouth and and you know will take things off teeth and the fish that are being cleaned won't eat them. There seems to be a, a level of trust there and a, and a kind of a, uh, an agreement not to be a predator while you're being cleaned by these fish. And that level of, of kind of different behavior based on having some sort of uh, benefit to yourself is not something you would think most fish, you know, are, would be capable of, of wisdom or of uh, uh, being able to think so differently about what to do if a fish is so close to your mouth that you don't eat it, you know. And yet we have all these examples of it. So for me, it's just clear that there's, there's more encodings than just intelligent encodings. There's more ways of encoding information and using it than there is abilities to think. And that is kind of an important aspect that needs to be accepted to kind of get further into anticipatory systems theory. You have to kind of recognize that there's more to anticipation than just what how humans do it mentally, right? Okay, next slide. This is making use of error. And as I mentioned, some of these um, species, it's diabolical what they do, you know. <clears throat> um, the firefly one particularly gets me because I love fireflies. And there's a uh, group of species, the Photurus fireflies, where the females have learned to make the flashing pattern of uh, another species, females. And when the males land to mate, they eat them. 
because they can't make a particular uh, protective chemical that that species, the Photinus species, can make. So in order to protect themselves and their eggs, they eat these males of that species and then they are able to pass on the protection of that biochemical to their own offspring. But it just seems, you know, to be in the dark and flashing the yes, darling uh, flash in the language of the photonous firefly. And then when the male lands, just to, you know, I just found that to be kind of horrific. Uh, but angler fish, for example, that have like a little lure of some sort um, that can make another fish, a smaller fish, think it's something they can eat and they get close enough and then they are eaten by the anglerfish. All of these um, are different examples of using mimicry, aggressive mimicry, uh, playing with the, the models of their prey species. And if you go to the next um, slide, which one of these is the spider? You know, I mean, it's, it's not just a behavior pattern Sometimes it's built, they build it into themselves to such a degree. So the bottom one is the spider and it can live in the nest of the ants that it preys on and just um, eat well, you know, and it's amazing how it resembles. I mean, that's a spider and it resembles an ant, which is an insect. And it's just, you know, there were a lot of those. And they look like the particular ant species that they prey on. So they don't all look like that spider. That spider only looks that way because it's encoded that species of ant into itself. You know, I mean, over eons, presumably. But that's an error. You know, that's a recognition error on the ant's part. Okay, next slide. And that's the the viper with the with the spider-like knob on its tail that it wiggles around like a spider and it's got kind of elongated scales around it that look kind of like legs and it really works i've seen video of it using that it's just amazing to me okay go to the next one here are a few that are using camouflage uh either to hide from predators or i think in the gecko's case to allow insects to come and land near it and eat them. But the level of building the environment into themselves so that they can blend in like that is just amazing. That one that looks like two twigs is actually a twig and a moth that looks like another twig. I mean, it's brilliantly done. And the, the, that's a Vietnamese mossy frog, I think it's called. Anyway, keep going. Next slide. I think there's a few more. And some of these are just kind of really cool. That's a gecko that's waiting to catch insects. And when it hunkers down on a log like that and then spreads out all that leafy edges, it's really hard to tell that that's a gecko. Keep going. There's another a couple of slides of... Yeah, if, can you see the spiders? <laughs> the one that wraps itself around a, a branch, you can see a little better than the one that's on the bark of a tree. But clearly, uh, they know their environment well enough to ha be able to just blend in so that they won't be detected until they're right on top of something they can eat. Go to the next one. Okay, so <clears throat> error when it's used by, you know, predators or prey to either catch food or to avoid being caught um, is one kind of error, but there's the other kind, which we see in science quite a bit. Um, when, when that decoding arrow doesn't match, you know, when the predictions of the model don't agree with what the system is doing. So you're trying to predict what the system will be doing. And then when the system does the thing and it's not what you predicted, then there's something wrong with your model. Either it's 
not accurate or it's not complete enough for the behavior that you're interested in. And even when they are accurate and complete enough, um, over time, the system has more degrees of freedom than the model. The model doesn't change. And so over time, the system inevitably will change. And then eventually the model will just be inaccurate because of that. And my father had a name for that. He called it temporal spanning. And uh, this is, you know, something that always will happen with modeling. It's kind of an inevitable thing. And so you have to kind of keep your wits about you in science when you're modeling. But organisms that are, you know, trying to optimize their options, they're trying to stay alive, they're trying to take care of what they need to take care of. Uh, some of the models, you know, are things that can't be changed, like uh, building building aspects of your environment into yourself, like with a fish that has gills. And if the water dries up, what is it going to do? You know, it, unless it has by accident some kind of other way of getting oxygen, like uh, a swim bladder that has a lot of vasculation or something, which is what my father um, hypothesized was what lungs evolved from. Um, it's going to die if if its environment changes too much, because it, once you build those kinds of things into yourself, they kind of predict that it will be that way. And then it has to stay that way or else it's dysfunctional. Um, so when environment changes rapidly within a single lifespan, even accurate models are rendered inaccurate. They become temporarily spanned. And when that happens, the errors can become life-threatening. And that is um, the biggest danger for life with rapid global climate change because it is going so fast. It's resembling the only things like it that we've ever seen are from the fossil record. And I talk about that a little bit later. But um, one serious problem with model-based navigation is that you can't tell from the model or the prediction that it's not accurate or appropriate. You can only tell by predict, you know, by comparing the prediction with the actual system. And even a bad model keeps spitting out predictions. And so most organisms don't have any other option but to follow their own internal navigation. And so they end up going off a cliff. And so this is a, a, what I have described it as, is a map versus territory problem. Go ahead to the next slide. And there's a GPS. I mean, that's a really good analogy for it. When the GPS hasn't been updated in a long enough time that it will give you directions for roads that no longer exist. Maybe there was a landslide and, you know, in, New in California that happens all the time. Um, if you go on uh, Google and do an image search of when GPS goes wrong, you'll see all kinds of things, all kinds of things. <laughs> okay, go to the next slide. So rapid change in the environment is incredibly dangerous for life. And the reason it is, is because of this modeling issue. Um, there are already examples of this happening around the planet. One is the snowshoe hare, which turns white for winter, and then it's brown in the summer. And so its internal guidance system is what predicts when winter is coming. And if winter is delayed by quite a long time because it's warming, here's going to be a white rabbit with no snow. And, you know, it'll stick out like a sore thumb. That is a huge problem for that species. Um, the monarch butterfly is already starting to f feel the impact of Roundup. Um, you know, when, when agricultural companies 
genetically engineered crops to be resistant to Roundup so that they could just indiscriminately spray and kill weeds, but not the crops. One of the weeds they've been killing is milkweed. And so, you know, if the milkweed plant really disappears from its range in the US and Canada, what will happen not only to the monarch, but what about all the species that are mimicking the monarch and getting protection from the fact that they are poisonous? Um, so that is going to impact a lot more than just one species. I think that's going to be true all the way around. You know, when we start to realize that the interdependencies in a in an environment um, are not always visible, but if if a keystone species goes down, it takes a whole lot more with it. So, um, I, I talk about this and I refer to it as anticipatory dysfunction. And it seems to me extinction cascades like the mass extinction events are started by and, and pick up steam because of this. So you, you can't really understand if it is true, you can't understand an extinction cascade without get at least having some idea of what anticipation means. Okay, go to the next the next slide. So <clears throat> the thing that that change uh the ways to measure change is by how fast it goes and by how much it is changing. And some species will be impacted immediately and some might not be, but each species that dies out of an environment will increase the speed of change and the magnitude of change and will take whatever other species were depending on its presence in the environment. Um, that will impact them too. So even species that were fine with the first changes that we're seeing now on the planet there will come a point where almost every species in an environment will be impacted by, you know, the change that's going on in their environment. And uh, I was looking at how many mass extinction events there have been. It says there have been five, but the worst one was called the great dying when 96% of life on earth died out in the oceans and on land. And, uh, some uh, scientists are saying we may be entering a sixth one, this one caused by human activity. So this is, you know, it's not something in the far distant future, it's already started here. Um, we're starting to see that, that the composition of the atmosphere has been changed by human activity and the changes in the atmosphere now are driving changes in the chemistry and pH of seawater. So these are, these are things that we need to talk about and we need to understand. So go to the next, next slide. There you have the, the five mass dying is the middle one, the end of the Permian. And we really don't wanna trigger one of those. Okay, next slide. So my question in reading all of that was if 96% of all species died off in the great dying, I wonder if we can, you know, conjecture what might have been different about the 4% that didn't die off. And my uh, hypothesis has always been that the evolution of intelligence seems to be the best you know, it's a better way of using models. It's better anticipation because you can recognize error and you can build, you know, workarounds. Like if you have somatic models that you can't change, you can create technologies, you know, and there are so many uh, different species that actually do use technologies. I didn't include that in this slide presentation because it would have made it too long. But um, 
hermit crabs are a, are a good example because they use whatever they can find as a shelter because they don't build their own shell. So they compensate for that fact by using a shell from another organism or maybe even a bottle or piece of trash that we've left lying around. And there's some very entertaining pictures on the internet of that also. Um, but we're not the only ones who have to compensate for the fact that we so, you know, we don't have a heavy fur coat, but we can still live in the Arctic. You know, we have figured out ways to, to build workarounds for ourselves. So you can, you can do a lot with intelligence as long as, as you, you know, you're aware of this, this uh, tendency for error to creep in and you have to not be too sure that you, that your models are accurate, but uh, it does allow for a great deal of, and it, maybe that's why we're so overpopulated. Okay, go ahead into the next, the next one. So this is my, my main set of ideas. It's also the second to last slide. Um, the human body runs on encoded models. The human mind similarly runs on encoded models. So it's not surprising to me that science uses models also. And uh, all of the things about error apply to science too. Um, it's very important that, you know, we, I don't think they teach modeling in science curriculum, do they? Have any of you guys ever had a class that talked about how to do modeling right? How to know when you have a good model, how to know how to apply it, because sometimes a good model is applied to something that it it, it exceeds the, the ability of the model to represent, but you use the model to represent something before and it worked great. So, you know, sometimes people think that they can use it in other places without realizing there may not be as much accuracy involved. Um, so it seems, kind of critical to me that if we want to understand ourselves, if we want to understand evolution, if we want to understand uh, how to protect our biosphere, our science has to build the anticipatory nature of life into these models that we're using. Um, because otherwise we will, we're sure to cause side effects at the very least. And you know, the, the, the second to bottom bullet is, you know, that one of the reasons that I, since he died in 1998, um, and I realized that I actually understood his work better than most scientists that I've met, uh, including some of his students, um, I feel like I, I have a duty to pass this information on and do whatever I can to help people understand what he was talking about. And I do think that he proved that when, when you can build relations in it and work together to achieve something, things become possible that would never have been possible outside of that relationship. And so uh, I do think, you know, there's a lot of hope. I see a lot of hope in the idea that we can use these ideas to do things better and to be more careful. And that's sort of the reason why I do what I do. So go to the next, the last slide, I think. Yep, yeah, that's it. So those are monarchs in their overwintery grounds. And uh, that's all I had room and time for. So we can open up the discussion here. Excellent. Thank you, Jude, for such a wonderful paced um, explanation and filled with illustrative examples of your father's work and some of your uh, duty to continue that well said. Um, yeah, so the the ability to unmute yourself is back on just, you know, that minor hiccup, but Okay. Yeah, we can open it up to the floor for discussions. You can either um, use the function to raise your hand or you can enter it to the chat. I'm going to click stop sharing just so we can all see each other. 
Um, okay. We can go. All right, Nishat. Yeah, I, I had a question about um, the initial slides that you were talking about, Judith. Mm -hmm. You said that anticipatory systems would apply even to bacteria and viruses, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I wasn't sure how a virus would be you know, anticipating ah. its environment because I always thought it's it's almost like a very mechanical, almost, almost a molecular form of life. Almost, yeah. And and in fact, there's been some argument over whether it's actually alive or not because, uh, it, you know, they do, they're dormant until they're not dormant. So like they're dormant until they're activated and they act like they're not alive. But so does the seed, you know. I mean, a seed could last in a dormant state for years and years and years, but it still has uh, aspects of, of metabolism and repair going on. But the thing about viruses that convinced me was that they recognize their host when they need it. And some have such a specific host that they won't activate unless they come into contact with their host. And so the rabies virus was the one that kind of convinced me because it seems to need a warm-blooded host, right? It doesn't infect a lizard. It doesn't infect a frog. It doesn't infect um, a cold-blooded species, but it won't infect a bird either. And I, and I thought, why not? You know, how does it differentiate? But for whatever reason, it only infects mammals. And it recognizes one when it meets one, you know? I mean, it has some kind of recognition protocol that activates it. And until that gets triggered, it won't activate. So the, the recognition of its host is present before it ever meets one. It's, it's an encoded model. And that means it is anticipatory, right? If you can find any kind of evidence of that sort of anticipation, um, then you're dealing with life, right? So if, if viruses are able to recognize a host when they encounter one, even though they've never encountered one before, then you're dealing with anticipation. It has to be. What else could it be? They don't think, you know. <laughs> um, there's not a thought process. It's not a learned behavior. What is that? It's an encoded thing, and it's an, somehow inherited. And that is the only proof I have that they are alive is that they are anticipatory. And there are some that are like, there are bacteriophages. They're really cool looking viruses. They look like a spaceship and they land on a bacteria and they inject, you know, they have like a, some sort of a, a body part that injects their DNA into the the bacteria that they prey on, but it's really, really specific. So specific that in Russia, they have a medical, they have a whole medical capacity for curing certain bacterial diseases using these viruses. And they deliberately infect your body with those viruses because the, the virus will not harm your own body cells. They will only go after those bacteria. And, you know, it seems kind of risky to me. I, I, I would have qualms, I think, but, uh, but it doesn't surprise me that there are, you know, these viruses that have evolved, co-evolved with particular bacteria such that that is the only thing they eat, right? But the trouble there is if they're, if they're, what they recognize as food is too specific, they will starve to death if that particular food item is goes extinct out of their environment, right? So it seems like a, a um, an evolutionary risk for them, you know, to be that, that specific, to have no flexibility in your, your models, I would think would have died out in one of these great extinction events and not come back again, you know? I, it would be an interesting thing to to figure out or study, but 
that will not be something I'll be doing. Sometimes I mention stuff like that for students. If, if, you know, students haven't figured out what they want to focus on. Sometimes it's cool to just throw stuff out there. And every now and then I'll hear from someone who, who made use of an idea like that. And it, that's always, you know, then I'm glad I did it. <laughs> so, but uh, is there some other aspect of, of anticipation that kind of struck you um, as needing more? I think we have a question from uh, Kelly as her hand up. Okay. Okay, so, so uh, it, I hope that I can get this this out in a succinct way. I'm mm -hmm. sure that this is better over drinks. Um, <laughs> but when I when I was looking at um, the the video uh, on YouTube mm -hmm. and the errors in terms of uh, our body and mind. Oh yeah. And one, um, I was looking at uh, whether it can go beyond um, living living entities like like uh, capitalism, and and well, so so a lot of their marketing mm -hmm. are uh, fooling our our minds. Like uh, I'm going to use the example of uh, disinfectants or cleaning supplies. Mm -hmm. Certain put these toxins in, and we're creating an environment that is actually bad for us. But we've been sold yeah. in our mind that that it's it, it's good. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, that's all you know. When you see uh, predators that are messing with the models of their prey animals, I mean, advertisers do the same thing. They do. Um, I've done some advertising, copywriting, and I, you know, it's all about trying to convince people to believe something. I could and, be fascinated. <laughs> yeah. You know, or to mess with their subliminal. Like, you know, when you, when you take a course in advertising and you see, like, in the ice cubes of some photograph for a drink, there's naked women, you know, and it's their market is men. And uh, the idea is that, okay, these you can't really tell very well unless you like blow up the picture and study it, you know, and squint at it, that there's naked women in those ice cubes. But subliminally, it kind of communicates and, and they, they hope that men will be attracted and buy this liquor, you know, kind of thing or beer or whatever. It, something that is a drink that needs ice. But uh, there's lots and lots of examples of that in advertising class and uh and it becomes you know we have all this intelligence and yet we're so easy to to lead astray sometimes and it, it i mean i think that, that that one of the issues that i run up against in terms of systems is that uh we keep trying to uh skew it back into uh how it can help business uh make more profit and oh yeah yeah. Is that, is that a double bind? Well, that certainly seems to be a corruption of, uh, you know, there's always people that will look for ways to, to um, exploit. I mean, I do think that's a biological pattern, but we're supposed to be able to think beyond that and, and recognize when it's counterproductive. And yet... You know, I mean, the examples of, of human beliefs leading people to do things that are just really, really so counterproductive, um, but they can't see it or they don't want to. Um, yeah, I'm not a huge fan of humanity in general. You know, I like individual ones very much, but <laughs> it's like, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, there's a lot that, you know, makes me want to secede from the species. And so, right now in the news, there's a whole lot going on that, yeah, but yeah. it is definitely, I mean, I think, you know, belief is model-based. It's a perfect example of following your models off a cliff um, where, you know, the idea that anybody who looks different or sounds different or speaks a different language or cooks different food or, you know, plays different music um, is somehow dangerous and should be 
either banned or you build fences or, you know, I mean, we're seeing that so much right now in the world. And you'd think we'd have gotten over that by now. I just wish we would evolve beyond it. But maybe if, if people start to recognize that these are all model-based behaviors, maybe that will help. I don't know. I hope so. I see, uh, uh, Elena, I see your hand up, but I just want to go to, um, Ashley had written a comment, so I just want to give them a chance. Ashley, was it a comment or did you want to um, expand on that any further? Um, just an opportunity to do so. In a comment? What's the comment? No, just more of a comment um, that organizations seem to also have some of these aspects in them as well of, of anticipation and um, I especially liked your your bit about um, how in situations where things are changing very rapidly, the the model's performance effectively degrades, yes. leading to extension. And we definitely see that. Yeah. And, you know, organizations that humans create are definitely going to have echoes of the models that we used to create them. I mean... That is true of machines as well. You know, that's one of the reasons the machine metaphor is so bad um, to try to use that, say that all systems are like machines. Was, was My father was very uncharacteristically blunt in his response to that. He said, it's not just a little bit wrong. It is entirely wrong and must be discarded. But science patterned itself on that idea. And then when all these or you know different areas of human uh, activity try to get scientific about their area like agriculture or education or even economics um we tend to get very machine like and we we've you know uh defined objectivity based on a machine perspective which for life one of the one of the most basic tenets of life and i think i described that in one of the early slides is that Every living organism has a fundamental model for self, a fundamental model for health of self, and then starts to evaluate all incoming information based on what is better or worse for health of self. So when you start to see organisms, how they navigate, it's, you know, they're the center of the universe, according to their models, and whatever self is. I should say, because there's collective organisms too. And then the collective, the collective is the self. And sometimes when an organism reproduces, offspring become self. They either become part of self or they become all of self. And you see organisms then who die after reproducing because um, they no longer recognize self as as, as their own model, it, it's their offspring and that's what has to survive. So like octopus mothers who stop eating and just protect their eggs until they hatch and then they die. Um, and there's there's even a species of spider that encourages it uh, its hatchlings to eat it. And I thought that was the most extreme one I've ever seen. But uh, they, you know, scientists being what they are, they, they tried comparing the offspring where the, they were allowed to eat their mother and compared those to offspring where they were prevented. And the ones that ate their mother did way, way, way better in survivability. And so that was their kind of, okay, I guess maybe this works, you know? It's like, sometimes I have to laugh at the, the kind of research that comes up. But anyway, so Elena, you have... Um, yeah, well, um, and then Donald um, and then um, I really enjoyed the presentation, but oh, one of the things that um, struck me was your example of the car and the GPS, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> I was thinking about the self-driving cars and the sort of mechanistic way that they build those anticipatory models, and mm -hmm. thinking that that might be a, a kind of a fatal flaw in some AI applications. I think so too. I think so too. Because certainly with a self-driving car, it's not going to question whether the GPS should be uh, followed. Whereas you would hope, I mean, you know, you would hope that uh, most of us would go, I can't see if there's a road there. 
and the GPS wants me to turn, but I know the ocean is near and I'm not going to turn there until I can see what, you know, but that, uh, that doesn't always stop actual human beings from doing stupid things. So I, I can't really answer to that, but I do think, you know, as we build these systems, like a self-driving car that follows the speed limit, even, you know, when you see a cop car on the highway and there's a long, long train of people behind it because they will not pass the cop car who's driving the speed limit and nobody drives the speed limit under normal circumstances, you know, there's a range of, of different speeds and what have you. And uh, it causes big problems when you have, <laughs> when you have like something written in stone in a, in an AI and it can't, it has no other options but to do what its navigation tells it to do, right? It's going to be an interesting situation when that gets going. Mm. Yeah. But I, you know, I can remember talking to uh, some of the AI developers about they were trying so hard to, to get computers that were intelligent, you know, like consciously aware. And, and I was trying to convince them that, there will be of absolutely no use to us if they do that. If you achieve that, it is going to have its own agenda and it is not going to do what we want. And they're not going to be a useful tool anymore. You know, if you have a computer that, that has its own uh, value for self and for health of self, you know, they, it would be a miracle, first of all, that they wouldn't regard us as a threat they're going to have an immune system then in a sense, in some sense. And, you know, it's just, it's, I don't know. I don't think they have enough of an understanding about biological systems, first of all, but certainly um, not enough people understand about anticipation either mm -hmm. or the model based, you know, behavior pattern that goes with it. So yes, all of that is, is, because that's what happened in, in um, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger's AI. I can't remember what it was called now. Terminator. Yes, that's it. Because they developed an immune system. That's what mm -hmm. happened. And, in yeah. you know, even in um, um, the movies where, where the planet itself... Um, developed an immune system. So like the Gaia hypothesis to me is, is not real because planet earth is not alive as an organism is. It just has living organisms populating it, but that's not the same thing. So if it closed the, you know, the entailment loops that my father identified all life have closed, like um, they make themselves, they aren't made from outside. That was one of them. If that ever happened, then we would be done for. You know, if Earth ever developed its own immune system, it would go after us. We know this would be. Because every time you drill a hole, every time you try to do hydrofracking, you know, <laughs> the Earth would open up and swallow you kind of thing. I mean, it would not put up with that if it was alive. So, yeah. It, it, I... You know, in my next life, I'm going to be writing more fiction and it will be science fiction like that. Because, mm. uh, you know, my father's idea is definitely, sometimes I think I could do more getting the ideas to more people if I, if I did that now, instead of talking to scientists, maybe I should just be writing fiction. Like Gene Roddenberry, you know, I grew up on Star Trek, so yeah, anyway, um... any... <laughs> we have Donald and then Dan after Donald. Okay. Well, oh, hi. I'll try to be both succinct and clear. Okay. That's quite a challenge. Um, just to talk about the the comment that was made about Gaia there. Mm -hmm. um, I heard on the weekend on the show that um, the long term trajectory of tectonic action. Mm -hmm. All the all the continents will move back together again into one giant one. And apparently that would be a mass extinction for just about every species that lived at that time. 
because mm -hmm. the extremes in temperature would be just incredible. So there you go. Maybe maybe it is happening. Yeah, that may have played into some of the uh, yeah, past yeah. ones. But the thing um, I wanted to talk about was uh, something that was also referenced in, in some of the previous comments. Um, I studied, um, it was difficult too, uh, Nicholas Luhmann, the um, social systems man, uh, yeah, who just said pretty much uh, came up with a quite plausible theory Mm -hmm. um, that in fact society is a parasite that lives in all our brains <laughs> uh, that's not exactly what he said but that's what it amounts to uh, well, it certainly behaves that way mm -hmm. certainly we give it space right mm -hmm. whatever we know about society comes from what we've learned and and mm -hmm. introjected mm -hmm. and um society doesn't always act in our interests well that's for in fact, sure it acts in its own interests right and uh well it you know, depends the, on who's doing yeah. it i mean what who, what the model is right well but, it ha it does a lot of good for us i don't think we could live without it at this point but yeah. the point is it also has its own intentions and its own mimicry and if we don't move fast enough to change like perfect example is what happened with the internet it started mm -hmm. as a fantastic connection still is still is don't mm -hmm. get me wrong but there's an awful lot of uh, very noxious things going on there, as we all know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and, wherever there's a niche, it is a biological pattern to exploit. Exactly. And and maybe it's beyond biology, you know? <laughs> Looking at, uh, what's his name, Robert Lanza's book, Beyond Biocentrism. Mm. <laughs> he thinks well, that, uh, yeah. But, you know, my father's contention was that mental behavior is an extension of living behavior. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, we don't always act in our own best interest. No. Humanity is, you know, capable of this kind of such a, a turning around of ideas that that um, suicide can become the only way you, you can avoid. You know, if suicide becomes your only way to remain who you are and not be become something you hate. Mm -hmm that you know what a tangle of of beliefs that is um mm. uh it just it's it's mind-blowing sometimes how how turned around it can get and somatic models too i mean when you when you realize there are so many immune system dysfunctions where mm. self you know uh mm. where your body is attacking its own cells mm. and is killing itself that way. You know, it's not a belief structure then, but it's the same basic thing. It's model-based mm -hmm. behavior. And so if, you know, I, I used to feel that if medical science could embrace the idea of, say, anticipatory systems theory and recognize that the immune system has models that we're already manipulating with like vaccines that's creating a new model teaching it a new model right of mm -hmm. this say covid virus um but if you could then get it to reset its attack protocol so that it would stop attacking your liver or stop attacking your pancreatic you know your islet cells or whatever it's attacking your lungs whatever um you could cure every kind of autoimmune syndrome that there is the mm -hmm. worry that I had, though, and I have to admit, uh, I haven't resolved this, is that can be weaponized. Oh, yeah. And if you can make somebody allergic to something that is innocuous, like I have a sibling who's allergic to peanuts, and they can kill him. And I can mm -hmm. eat all the peanuts I want. But mm -hmm. he, one one teeny fraction of a peanut would set him into anaphylactic shock. So yeah. if you were able to get an immune system to have that kind of reaction to something that is around you all the time, that, that would be a way to, to assassinate people and have no trace of how, yeah. you know. So I, I, I worry about how much to say and who to say, <laughs> say it to because I do not want to contribute to something like that. And, you know, mm. I don't know 
where to draw those lines. I would love to get some advice really about that. Mm -hmm. I mean, should I just figure that the people who use it for that, it's on them? Or should I, you know, just, uh, I don't know. I have, I have philosophical concerns about that and I haven't resolved it. Mm -hmm. But in any case, I do think that our social systems are a reflection of our own mental models. And so uh, there are certain things that just don't, don't work very well, especially in a collective way. Certainly religions are starting to go that way when you start to see all of this really, really, even though the religion teaches peacefulness and protecting life and stuff, and then you start to see fanatics of that religion doing the very opposite of what their own religion teaches. Yeah. And they think they're being devout and stuff. And what do you do about that? I don't know. Beliefs are really powerful. And it's very, very hard to get someone to look at their beliefs yeah. uh, and see anything but what they ch have chosen already. And they're in contagious too, right? Mm hmm yes there's a certain herd mentality to our species that that you know like peer pressure and things like that seem to work and i've always been a rebel so <laughs> to me it's like as soon as i see that happening i go the other way but I, you know i recognize yeah. that it's a definite problem definite yeah. problem and I don't know what to do about it. I, I do not have answers for that. I really don't. I wish I did. Hmm. Uh, Anybody we else? Have, we have oh. Dad uh, up next. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted to thank you first, uh, you know, Judith, for what you're doing, because it certainly is a noble thing, a very noble thing you're doing. And mm -hmm. I think, really, and you're sharing your hope for the rest of us. And you're even asking us, you know, to give you some advice in what you can do, like what you should be doing in sort of yeah. the face of all these things. I'm going to offer some thoughts around that. And, okay. you know, I'm not going to tell you it's going to work. I'm not going to tell you it's better than any other idea you have. Um, it's going to really speak to my own observations and experiences that I've had mm -hmm. where I have been successful in getting ideas across getting engagement and all those other things which you're trying to do mm -hmm. like clearly this sort of thing whether we like it or not revolves around relationships right it revolves around the people you know the people who respect you uh the people who love you the people close to you mm -hmm. um, and i'd like to think this group has a lot of that for you it's our it's your community that you're speaking to now right people that uh have an interest in systems thinking have an interest right. in trying to understand what anticipatory systems are, have an interest in, you know, kind of using intelligence as you described to stay, you know, stave off mass extinction. Yeah. So I think that's, I think clearly that's the number one thing you can do and you're doing that. And, and maybe you feel that that's not enough. I, I don't know. Maybe that's the best you can do, but I would urge you to continue to do that because it okay. represents who you are. It represents everything good that you can give us. Right. That you can educate me and say, hey, you know, Dan, just think about this. And then <laughs> maybe one day I'll think about it and share it with somebody else in my community. It's going to happen in that way, the small mm -hmm. way. It's not the big, not like a president of the United States, as it were. I'm not saying that yeah. you have to do this. Standing in front of people saying, hey, I know the answer. Just follow me. It, right. It That's politics. It doesn't work. Yeah. People yeah. have to. It's like you said, they have to have self and health of, you know, self, right? They have to mm -hmm. have that. Now, that's the, the side of it from where you sit, okay? Now, let me just share with you something on a much broader scale and that you can help me with, okay? Okay. I, no surprise, okay? Since I'm in tech my whole life, I, I know what to be afraid of in tech. I know mm. what it can do. I know mm. that the power of this generative AI stuff is very frightening, actually, okay? Mm. And I've actually talked to my colleagues also in IT and said, hey, listen, I don't know, man, these machines, as you said, could start to feel threatened and they can develop immunity. They could they could try to build up walls so we cannot like stop them from taking right. us. Mm -hmm. So 
when I presented that idea to a colleague of mine, I said, no, I'm not worried. And this is also a guy who's been tech most of his life. I'm not worried. I said, what do you mean you're not worried? He said, the intelligence is not coupled, not structurally coupled to the body. In other mm. words, intelligence, mind, and body. They're separate. Mm -hmm. So if you look at everything we do, like what's happening here, it's about mind and body. They, mm -hmm. work, they work together. You cannot separate them. And that's right. what makes us human. That's what makes us obviously intelligent, but also allows us to execute on that intelligence. Mm -hmm. So when he said that, I understood that that's kind of like a reprieve for me. I'm not saying that can't happen. I'm not saying they couldn't build a robot that has, you know, like this like biological data. system, right? And yeah. then combine it with the intelligence. I'm not saying that, we, that that won't happen. Mm -hmm. But clearly, that's within the scope of what you said. It's in our hands now. It's mm -hmm. so when I go down the street and talk to somebody and they ask me, so what should I do about this intelligent stuff? I'm going to say things like, well, listen, for starters, you shouldn't believe everything you hear. Yeah. Because this generative AI stuff said, you need to challenge that. You need to say to the thing, hey, that thing might not be true. And mm -hmm. in fact, it's a known fact that generated, generated AI stuff is generating crap. It's just yeah. that you don't know about it at the time you're given it. If you don't yeah. know anything, and, it sounds so, plausible. Yeah, yeah, it sounds, it sounds plausible. So that's what we can do, like me and you and whoever else on this, that side of the equation. On the side, what you said is, can we use intelligence? I think we can. And I'm hopeful that we can fend off this thing, whatever it is, in the future mm -hmm. years to come, that we can fend off that. And it's only through things that you say, you know, you tell us, you know, kind of use your intelligence. Don't, you know, don't do X, Y, Z and all that other stuff you talked about today. Mm -hmm. like that's what you got to keep on doing. Now, having said that, said all that, okay, now I'm looking at in terms of communication to the masses, as it were. Mm -hmm. Fiction, I think, is a much more powerful vehicle for doing that. That's this what stuff I, that you've yeah. done here is good for this community, but not for the mm -hmm. community that doesn't know anything about science. That's right. afraid of tech guys like me. I mean, seriously, I used to be able to walk into rooms, still do sometimes, and people are afraid of me because I'm a tech guy. This, <laughs> is, not, this is not conducive to good communication. It's not yeah. conducive to community. And that's why when you said let, write fiction, I thought that's a grand idea. I mean, obviously, don't give up your day job, but <laughs> fiction. And yeah. I think that embraces, that could embrace everything you talked about. You can yeah. talk about your fears. You can talk, you can manifest everything you're afraid of through the fiction. And people mm. get that way better than you sitting down and saying, hey, don't do this. They don't like that. Nobody no, likes that. True. Yeah. So I'll leave that with you. And I, I don't want you to be discouraged, okay, Judith? Okay. I mean, this is like a pep talk. If you get to that place, <laughs> if you get to that place, man, you you tell Zad and he'll give you email. I'll give you my email now. Mm -hmm. oh, I wouldn't let you do that. You're you're too good. You shouldn't okay. allow yourself to do that. Okay. I well, have so something for you that might actually encourage you too, because my father, <clears throat> um, he used to get asked a lot about AI and about artificial, you know, life, artificial uh, intelligence, and uh, and. We used to watch Star Trek together, too, by the way. Um, so there's the character Data, the, the mm -hmm. um, artificial life form. But he was alive and he was intelligent. And uh, he wasn't just a, a you know, <laughs> a machine, yes. even though he started out as an artificial one. But, um, but my father said that if, if the digital realm is what they are using to try to create AI and currently that is what they're using, right? It's all right, that's right. It's all digital, yes. He said there is not enough entailment in the digital realm for life or mind. That's correct. Because all it's complex. Is, it's complex. Right. It's just that's like right. you nailed it. It's complex. That's so why all they, they can can't do is, solve that. Right. So they, they can't can solve only that. simulate. Yeah. Not they now. Only, yeah. Not now. Like maybe one so, day, but not now. This is this is a tremendous problem. The linking yes. the the complexity of a of a body, the living system with an AI. That's a non-trivial problem. Mm -hmm. And and I, I asked uh, one AI developer that I knew, and at the time I wasn't sure of the answer, but I've since become sure of the answer. I said, if you actually were to create artificial intelligence, like a consciousness, would you have also created life? And he wasn't sure. <laughs> uh, he said, "Whoa, I'd have to think about that." But <laughs> I've since come to the realization that so mind is anticipatory. Yes, that's right. So if you create an actual anticipatory intelligence, like consciousness, that 
is its own anticipatory system that is organized in such a way that it can, that it manifests these patterns of behavior that are anticipatory and it's model-based and so on and so on, you will have created artificial life also. So whatever medium that would be possible to do in would also then be a living medium. Um, and, and I don't know what that would look like. And I, and that's one thing I am very careful not to help anybody do, <laughs> you know, I, I've had a few science colleagues who were getting money from military, like American military. Yeah, 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 yes. Weaponizing no. it, like you said. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, thank yeah. you. I will not. I never get paid. I never, I never get paid and I don't care anymore. Uh, but, but I, I don't want their money, you know? So I finally decided that maybe it's better to just keep it clean and just do it because I feel like I, you know, oh, 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 humanity, something to try to, I have kids, I have grandkids, you know, so I have to do what I can to try to help heal the biosphere and stop causing the damage we're doing because we could really take care of our, our needs using our own creativity. We just have to stop, tweaking old technology and reinvent some of these things because the way we've done them before is based on the machine metaphor you know the whole industrial agriculture thing that is not how we should be growing our food you know you end up destroying the soil the ecosystem of the soil and then the food is not as nutritious or it needs so much chemical support uh, to replace what used to get from from the ecosystem of the soil and so forth and so on. I mean, we we just keep on doing the same thing with each system that we try to get scientific about with the mistaken belief that being mechanical is equivalent to being scientific. And that I would really love to be able to help science uh, advance beyond because uh, it's not appropriate for life. We keep trying to get our heads into the mindset of the machines that we've designed and built. What a waste of what our minds are capable of, it seems like to me. So, so to try to be objective like a machine is not, that's counterproductive. <laughs> it's another one of those counterproductive things. So I just yeah. want to be mindful of time and I think we're hitting a, ah. a good spot. Good spot. I think maybe we can get two more questions. Is I see Ashley hands up in the shot. You had your hand up, so feel free to come back okay. on after Ashley. So we'll just do two more and then we'll wrap. Okay. Um, your your most recent comment about the industrial ag agriculturalists. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm wondering if we can just do a bit of a, a thought exercise here. Mm -hmm. If the environment changes fast enough that it forces their existing defaults to change because mm -hmm. they're in, we, we have to assume a certain level of intelligence there. Okay. Do we not therefore hope that they have some kind of virtue that they don't just make things even worse? You mean like the people who design agriculture or the ones that are driving roundup 3.0, you know, yeah, like whatever I... it is that they're going to come up with to, to deal yeah. with the change that we, we, that we create like i think that there's another level to this which is that uh, we have to somehow um mm -hmm. make them want to make a change in a positive direction i do think that is partly already happening in in that like community supported agriculture have you heard of it it's it's kind of a brilliant thing and it's really popular around rochester new york um where you know a farm sells shares early in the year and the people who pay for a share get their vegetables all season and uh that way the farmer even if say the weather is so terrible that there's not very much to give the farmer doesn't go bankrupt and you get something and they build a relationship with you and so you know some of them even take it to the point where it, you can use your own labor as part of your, or all of your, if you don't have money, you can go and help work out with shifts on the farm and getting harvest ready for people and stuff that have bought shares. But community supported agriculture is usually organic 
agriculture, at least here it is. And uh, it, you know, whole families go and spend time on the farm and learn about where their food is coming from, which is something that, as a kid that I never, you know, we never did that. The farmers were separated from us and we didn't even have any involvement. And uh, it, it would be good for humanity to, to bring those things back into our societies, I think, because then you care about the farm and you care about the farmers and you are getting fed that way and you know what's healthy and what isn't. I mean, you learn so much more um, about these ecosystems of the soil and, and what, how weather, you know, plays into these things. And that, the weather issue is maybe going to be what you're sort of what you're, you're suggesting is going to force industrial agriculture to, to rethink because it's going to get more and more and more extreme. I mean, we're just going to start oscillating. We're already oscillating between extremes. I mean, it's been the hottest and the coldest, you know, temperatures. And yet the average is still going up. So the global average is rising slowly, but you're still seeing like uh, record cold and record hot temperatures all across the planet, you know, in the seasons and record strength hurricanes and hurricanes before and after the season is, uh, you know, officially book bookended kind of thing. And um, so that may force industrial agriculture because you, you can't predict that kind of weather anymore. It's just gotten so far outside the norm that it can wipe things out. You know, it can wipe I think that may be the thing that gets humanity to, to, to turn around. Could be, could be, because when the weather is really bad, we are helpless, right? And two really bad storms back to back can wipe out a whole civilization. So um, when it really gets moving like that, I think, I hope that humanity will, you know, be willing to try different ways of doing things. Because what do you do? Of, in hmm? the case of the industrial agriculturalist or that mm -hmm. kind of like commercial farming kind of thing, their their default is already set, which is it's, to do the, the chemical route, mm -hmm. right? And therefore, like, it's more likely that they double down on their default than... They would they try go. for a while until the weather like wiped out the chemical uh, industry or something like that, right? <laughs> I, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm just maybe I'm a bit commenting on a bit of a hopeful thing here, which is that once people are aware of what their defaults are and the mm -hmm. the, the deleterious activity or the deleterious, deleterious results of it, mm -hmm. ideally they they adjust what their default is. I would hope so. That moves in the right direction, but they have to become aware of those. Yeah. And know that their their way of anticipating and their their way of doing whatever they do is mm -hmm. unintended consequences that we don't like. Right. I you know I can only hope they find they recognize it before it's something that can't be uh, easily you know either reversed or at least ameliorated. Right. We. But that's where you just have to not let yourself um, think the worst because then, you know, hopelessness is the enemy in that direction, I think. And it, mm -hmm. it's not useful. What good does it do? And what if you're wrong? You know, yeah. what good does it do to be hopeless? And what if you're wrong? So, so for every reason I can come up with, there's no point. And that's where maybe belief is useful. Like there's just the power of belief because if you decide, okay, I'm never going to let myself think that there's no hope. Um, then maybe, you know, you'll keep fighting when you otherwise would give up and giving up is, kind of, it, it doesn't help. It doesn't help. So I just, I feel like I need to meditate more than I am. <laughs> <laughs> so um 
we're we're just at eight nineteen in the Eastern time zone. Um, but the conversation is going well. And Nishad, did you want to maybe get one final point back in? You had your hand raised earlier, and then we can wrap. Okay. Well, I don't really have a question because I raised my hand mostly like to comment on you know uh, in the context of the conversation you were having with mm -hmm. uh, what Ashley pointed out, as well as Dan Eng concerning mm -hmm. AI, etc. Mm -hmm. I don't really have a question, uh, so I don't. I don't know if I should really talk about it. But um, a final question, if you, if I may, a final question would be that you know, especially in the context of climate change mm -hmm. and the various topics that we've been talking about, the Anthropocene extinction event mm -hmm. that we are going through, the sixth extinction event. Do you, do you have like a solution for? the climate change problem or the disappearance of just tens of thousands of insect species almost every day right now yeah or what what what's your what's your like how, how would you suggest that we individually or as a group or even as a global community would tackle this problem or you know make any kind of hedgeway in this i think so this is where I start to think that fiction would be would would be useful. I mean, that was the direction I was going in when my dad died. You know, I have a million short stories written already, but I I I sort of put that on the back burner to sort of be his legs and his voice and get the work out there again. Which there will be a website up with papers that have been unavailable um, within the next few months and stuff like that. But um, if people could recognize that, so they think, oh, what, what does it matter if, you know, some species of fly disappears or whatever, or insects in general, like all the insects, you know, that live far, far away from me, if they all died out, what does that matter? And what they have to recognize is that you don't really know what you depend on until it's gone, you know? We depend on a whole lot of microbes that we don't know the names of that live in our gut. It's a, it's a niche environment, but they help us in ways that we don't even realize. And the more that's learned about it, the more it blows my mind. You know, we can't get vitamin K from our food kind of thing, but we have organisms that can make it and they do. And that's why we can't get it, by the way. Um, you know, we have their presence encoded kind of such that it predicts that we're going to get it somehow and we don't have to make it. You know, if it's present in the environment, you don't have to make it kind of thing. But if we could get people to recognize the interconnected, interdependent um, nature of ecosystems, that has to go some length towards getting people to recognize that caution is warranted here when you start talking about loss of biodiversity in the, in any environment on earth i mean if if organisms are dying off as i described in the in the slideshow such that eventually species that were never impacted by the initial insults are impacted by the loss of a species in their environment that they were dependent on right that's going to impact us eventually and and surely human intelligence will recognize in self-interest, if nothing else, if nothing else, um, if you can show someone how their own family or themselves will be negatively impacted by something that they, you know, would never have thought would lead to th that kind of impact. That's the kind of thing that I keep trying to show in these slide presentations and stuff. Um, because it's the kind of thing that they otherwise would have to learn by trial and error. And, and that's the, you know, if you could avoid learning by trial and error, you're better off, right? It's much better off not to have to learn that the hard way and to learn it and understand it from basically from models, which is what like science fiction stories are. They're like an alternative model or universe that you can 
live in in your head for a little while and see how that works and decide whether any of those ideas might be useful. You know, I mean, the thing about Star Trek that that appeals to me, I like a lot of the other science fiction, like The Expanse and Star Wars and, you know, all of it. But Star Trek in particular, because humanity had evolved beyond the kind of racist, uh, bigoted, you know, sexist stuff that we still see around the world today. And uh, and you had a Russian on the bridge and you had, you know, a woman on the bridge. And had, like he, he created a situation where you could see them all working together and it wasn't, it wasn't holding them back. And then they would go to a planet where certain aspects of current human, you know, society on earth are represented, but there's just enough distance that maybe people could recognize how stupid it was. Like that there was a species that was black on one side and white on the other. And the last two beings from that planet. So the ones that were black on one side hated the ones that were black on the other side. So they were both black and white. But one is black on the left and the other is black on the right. And so they hated each other. And these two were the last. They killed themselves off the whole planet. And these were the last two. And they were trying to kill each other. And, you know, to watch that episode, I mean, it made a huge impression on me. And I was a little kid in the 60s. I was born in 1960. So um, I thought, how stupid, you know. <laughs> but... Then you see human societies doing the same kind of stupid, stupid things about skin color or language or religion, you know, like you see a Sikh and you think it's uh, an Arab and you've decided you hate Arab people or something. I, 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 the human propensity for, for behaving like ants sometimes just really bothers me. But I think that Gene Roddenberry was a genius in trying to illustrate ways that we wouldn't get sort of self-defensive, you know? I mean, he wasn't saying, you guys. Um, he was saying, look at this planet of these aliens behaving so so poorly towards each other and it's so self-destructive. I mean, you, know, you can just see it, it's so clear. But um, he managed to avoid the tripwires of belief that exist in his audience, I think. And that was sort of what I, you know, when I started to try to come up with a way to illustrate some of dad's ideas. Uh, I'm working on a book that translates his work in much greater detail. And I'm thinking that I'm going to include short stories in it because uh, I think that's a good way to to show people rather than tell them in a way, you know, and to make it more entertaining also. So I hope yeah. that works, you know, I hope that works. Thank you. I also, you know, do cartoons and drawings and things like that. And sometimes cartoons can do a lot of that as well. If you can make people laugh, but also see the grain of truth in there, mm -hmm. that might help maybe. It's yeah, worth a try, <laughs> right? The creative, the creative format has a lot of potential in it from the diversity of, of writing, illustrations, evoking uh, deeper feelings and emotions that go beyond any rational type of um, sharing. But yeah. Prashant, I, I, see your, I see your hand. All right, Prashant, let's, uh, all right, you, you, you can get the last one in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I know I wasn't, well, I wasn't supposed to talk, but I won't no be of time. I just want to comment. First of all, I liked the presentation. It oh, thanks. Gave me a lot of insight on like how the natural behavior of human itself is anticipatory. Um, and why do we do things the that the way we do and how mental models work. Mm -hmm. like um, I just want to comment on your uh, on your work or your future work about stories. And I do think that you should write it because I think Zed can confirm uh, with like from my side as well that there is something called foresight in our master's strategic foresight. Mm -hmm. 
And oh, it, cool. Foresight is, so in an idealistic way, foresight is reliant on the system's perspective. And mm -hmm. um, also like the signals that are happening and we predict futures from it. So one of the most common frameworks would be data score futures, where we talk about um, continuous growth, collapse, uh, mm -hmm. transformation, and there was another one, which I can't mm -hmm. read. Um, but it'll yeah. come to you. Yeah. Yeah. So data score futures, you will get an idea. So it essentially talks about how signals can be affected in different ways and that can mm -hmm. be just formed and how how can strategies work in all of those four futures to get us to an idealistic future mm -hmm. so, and many people have done this course and done science fiction books as well which have been published and popularized mm -hmm. quite well I would say amongst the foresight community at least so i do think that it shouldn't be your next life thing it should be your this life thing because you already have <laughs> that's I good would to, like hear. to know your thoughts more in terms of like the futures that potentially exist tomorrow okay that's cool that's really cool yeah yeah it's way more um it suits me better you know i mean I was very surprised to discover that I knew as much about my father's work as I did. You know, I was just missing him and I Googled him back in like 2000 and whatever. And uh, when there was a Google that suddenly existed and I discovered there were discussion lists about Robert Rosen, you know, and I went to one and they were arguing about what he meant in some quote that they had. And I read the quote and I knew exactly what he meant you know, because I knew him so well. And um, so I joined that list and that was really the beginning of the whole thing. And then one of the people in that list was John Kinnaman, who, who was a member of the IFSS. And so he, he sort of dragged me into the IFSS. And then I discovered my father was a past president of it, you know. <laughs> so that's how it kind of all snowballed, but... Um, but I, I wasn't able to really use my, my writing skills as well as I would have liked, other than I did write a short story about uh, that got published by, um, it got published in the second edition of, of Anticipatory Systems. It was a short story where my father uh, was at the gates of hell and ended up having a big discussion with Satan about his work, you know. Uh, and it was a way for people to meet him because I knew, you know, nobody can meet him now because he's gone. But I breathed life back into him through fiction because I can. So the only way people can meet him now is if I recreate what he was like. And so here he is talking to, to a non-scientist, right? Even It's Satan, but it's a non-scientist and they were drinking at Satan's Palace, you know, I mean, it's a funny story with kind of a dark comedy element to it. But you get inside my father's head there because that's what the short story was for. That's the way I wrote it. And I, you know, once it was published, I had a few of his old colleagues call me and say, you know, I'd forgotten how much fun he was to talk to. And you brought it all back with this story. And that just made me so happy because that meant that I succeeded, you know, that I I built the model accurately enough that people could then benefit from it. You know, if if they if that triggered memories in some of his old colleagues, then that was all the proof I needed that I had managed to at least contain enough of the reality of what he was like for people to to um at least get a, a, the flavor of what he was like, you know. And that, that's a gift, right? So mm. it's that's... worthwhile. Thank you, Judith. And... I think that's a wonderful like um, way to kind of close that in terms of the gift, you know, the gift of mm -hmm. what's kind of passed on and the gift of this knowledge and, and, and the thread that 
weaves through using our intelligence and anticipating what's next. And so um, thank you so much for being part of this. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. I think we all greatly appreciate the work that you do in continuing to share your father's ideas more broadly uh, and in different ways. And I think there's been a resounding um, consensus here that we are all looking forward to its next format in a fictional or in a <laughs> format. Um, from from Dan's suggestions to to a lot of the group were, were kind of resembling around that. And, and yeah, we always just appreciate your uh, trip to Toronto and sharing this knowledge and checking in. So it's wonderful to do this virtual as well. Um, yeah. We hope to stay in touch and do it again on the, on the first of the fictional story prototype. And we can kind of chat through that one together. That would be useful. It would be useful to yeah. have like an audience that I could run a few ideas by. You know, especially yeah. that you guys understand that the 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 idea of including short stories with translations of his ideas is to help illustrate and help people maybe uh, project better into the future um, where things can lead and where we really do need to come up with alternatives because even if I'm not accurate in exactly where they lead, they're not going in the right direction. You know, I can see that much about a lot of those things. And so it would be good to, and again, getting some advice about what maybe I shouldn't talk about, you know, he decided not to publish his ideas on creating an artificial life form. He felt like he could do it. And he felt so sure that he didn't feel a need to test it he was certain that he could do it, but he didn't want to try and he didn't want to tell anybody how he would do it because he didn't want, he said, we're getting into enough of a mess with things like genetic engineering. And that would be nothing compared to what we, you know, if we miss, if we create life and mistreat it, he felt that might be the worst sin we could commit, you know, for him anyway. So, he felt like it would unleash, you know, mayhem on our, on our grandkids and great grandkids and whatever. And, and he didn't right. want to be responsible. So he didn't publish any of that and he didn't leave any notes. And even if he did, I wouldn't tell anybody, you know, right. I would probably burn those. I don't know. I have a yeah. problem with burning stuff, but I, I I'm not going to pass that along, but uh, so I want to make sure I don't contribute to that kind of thing. I don't know that what, I don't think my understanding is at the level that his was. So I, I don't think there's that much danger, but I, I'm not sure. I don't yeah. want to, I don't want to be responsible for doing harm. Yeah. So. And that's, that's the value of this group is you, we can, we all have, folks that we can think alongside um mm -hmm. and and kind of talk about that through and hence hence the hence the group so you're always even though you're in rochester being able to do this uh at times is always great so happy to yeah. do it again yeah. okay cool i would awesome. really like that thanks you guys yeah. thank you so much judith thank you everyone wonderful session and the next one is november 13th um we'll keep you posted on who and what in what format um but yeah Thank you so much, awesome. everyone. Thank Have a you. great night. All right. All right. Thanks, Judith. You're Bye. welcome. Bye.